Welcome to Casual Friday. So I'm going to tell you what I've been up to this week, and then I will answer a question that has come up in my Ravelry group and in the comments of some of my videos in the past couple of weeks. And then I'll talk a little bit about the August sock knit along. So last week I shared with you my finished serviceable sweater and I've really been going gangbusters on sweaters uh, in the first six months of this year. And it's, it's summertime. I am not in the mood to do a sweater and have something uh, wool and hot sitting on my lap. Summertime is when I work on smaller projects, often socks, which is one of the reasons I thought the August sock knit along would be a fun thing to do this summer. And last summer was when I learned to spin. And so I've been trying, I've been working really hard and trying to make spinning a habit. I'm, I'm not succeeding, but I think that I will soon be able to have some more motivation to make that happen. When I was at Plyaway, which is a spinning conference, I was there in early April. And while I was there, I took a class on drum carters because I didn't know really much about them. And Clemis and Clemis, this uh, father son, who make various uh, spinning related equipment, they taught a class on drum carters and it was really amazing. And I loved their drum carters. And so I ordered one when I was there and they, they thought it was going to take four to six weeks and it didn't come. It didn't come. I just got an email earlier this week that it was on its way and then I would be, it would be arriving on Monday. So I've been working really hard at washing some fleece. I've been kind of poking along at washing a fleece I bought at Shepherd's Harvest because I didn't have any equipment to process it other than uh, to wash it. But now that I know my drum carter is coming, I finished washing my uh, it's called CVM, California Variegated Mutant. And it's a sheep that has multiple colors. And so here's a little bit of the wash lease. So there's a lot of this sort of light gray color. And then there's some that's really dark and not as much of the dark. And so I think it'll, and then the gray kind of goes into cream as well. So it'll be a really interesting a wool to see how it blends together and then I'm really looking forward to spinning it. I split the fleece with my friend Celeste and she has washed hers so it's, it'll be fun to see uh, what her yarn looks like and then compare that to what my yarn looks like. So that is going to be starting very soon for me. So I've had a question show up in the video comments as well as in my Rocks Rocks group lately. And we have had some discussion about it, but I thought it would be an interesting question to bring up here on Casual Friday. And the question is, how do you, do you determine the direction something was knitted, particularly if you can't see the edges, like if there's some kind of border that surrounds the entire thing, so you can't see where the cast on was or the bind off, how do you do that? So what I thought I would show you is a series of knitted items. Um, they were knit in different ways. Uh, they were, some of them are color work, some of them are textured uh, work, some of them were knit in one direction, some were knit in multiple directions. And there is one item where um, the edge has surrounded completely by an I-cord bind off. And so you can't tell where the cast on and bind off edges are. So I wanna start with color work. Uh, because I, I really think that something like stranded color work is probably the easiest type of knitted fabric to determine the directionality of the knitting. Um, but even if this were solid color, we can look at some clues. We can look at the two edges to see if they look different from each other. Now there are cast on methods and bind off methods that are identical. And sometimes people will, will want identical bind off edges and they'll start with a provisional cast on so that they have live loops and they can bind off in both directions. But often you can tell by looking at the cast on and bind off edges. So what I'm looking for here is a sign of something that looks like a cast on or bind off. And what you see here is that chain edge that you get, uh, typically get with a bind off edge. Now there are cast on methods the crochet cast on looks very much like this. So it is possible 
that this could have been a crochet cast on. Let's look at the other edge. Now this edge appears to be the long tail cast on. You can see the smooth side of the cast on at this edge and on, on this edge you'll see the bumpy side. Every, every column of stitches has a bump at the bottom. Now again there is a bind off method, the outline stitch bind off, that gives the exact same appearance as the long tail cast on. So our first guess with this is that this is probably the long tail cast on and a standard bind off edge. It could be a crochet cast on and the outline stitch um, bind off, but let's look at some other clues. With stranded color work, you're working a couple of stitches at a time in one color and then you're alternating to another. And so what we can see here is that we have these lone stitches right here and they look like a V. We always talk about with stockinette stitches that they, they look like Vs. And the problem with stockinette is that if you look at just a solid color, they look like Vs in the other direction. But with color work, we can definitely see that the Vs are upside down here in this direction, but they're right side up in this direction. So that tells us that this was the cast on edge and this was the bind off edge. Now again, there could be some little trickery going on where somebody was, was working edges differently than we expected, but we know for sure at least the center part was done uh, in, in this direction and we could follow a column of stitches all the way up and then confirm that these stitches were also worked in, in that the, these are the same column of stitches going up. We can see there's the V of this stitch and then we see the head of a purl stitch. We see the V of a, of a knit stitch, the head of a purl stitch. So we can be pretty confident that this entire thing was all knit in that direction. Now let's look at something that's mostly stockinette but has a little bit of texture going on. And if you were looking at this texture, you might not know for sure what was happening. But we can also see that this fabric has some shaping. It's wider at the bottom and it gets narrower at the top. So it could either have been started at the top and then increases could be worked to make it wider or it was started at the bottom and decreases were worked to make it narrower. So let's look at the stockinette and let's look at the transition between the stockinette and this texture right here. When you have something like this where there is a panel of a different stitch pattern, look at the transitions between the panel, the vertical panel and the stitches surrounding it. And what you can see here is that we've got stockinette here and that there's shaping and then there's this column of purl stitches here and then we have um, this stitch pattern going on here. So it's this transition between the stockinette and this column of purl stitches that shows us that these V's are formed like this. There's a full V right at the edge of that transition. That tells us that this was knit in this direction. And then we can look at the shaping. What we have here are two columns of stitches and then you see the stitch lying on top and then it's one column. So these two columns of stitches have been decreased down to one column and you can see the stitch that's on top and you look like, look like at this and you can see there's a full stitch underneath. If you were to look at it from this direction, it would just look a little strange. If you look at that transition between the stockinette and that purl column, you can see that there's a full V right here and then a half of a V at the edge here. So it's an upside down V. So that means that this was not knit in this direction. It was knit in the other direction. So now we have something that has cables and lace and something like this right here can be really difficult in, on its own to figure out what direction but we can look at the things that are flanking something like this. Look at the clues that we're given in other places to determine the direction of the knitting. So let's look at the cable first. So we see that there are some stitches crossing other stitches and they're overlapping and it can be kind of hard to, to distinguish one stitch from another. But again, you have a column of purl stitches flanking this cable. And what do you see here? You see a full V, another full V, and you've got a V that's kind of folded under. And then you've got three more V's where it, the full V ends at the edge. So you've got three stitches 
crossing three stitches here. So you can tell that the direction of the knitting was, was in that way. We can confirm by looking at this leaf pattern and you can see that going up the center of the leaf is one full V. So that tells you that that's a full stitch going up the center. You can also look at these uh, knit stitches that are, that are going t away and then toward the center again. And you can see two full stitches here that there's the two, full v, uh, two full Vs of stockinette flanked by all of the, the purl stitches. So let's look at this. There's a lot going on in this sweater. There's some just knit pearl texture stitches going on and then the, the, this uh, traveling cable that's going on. But we can focus on what's happening right here because just a couple of stitches flanked by pearls. And what we see when we look at this is that we've got a full V in the center, but we've got half V's on either side. This doesn't, this looks like it's two stitches, but it doesn't quite look right. It doesn't look like it was knit in that direction. So let's turn it upside down. And then we can see, oh, this was knit in this direction. We can see the two full stitches in that direction. What can be confusing though, is if you look at the collar, you can see now that the collar was not knit in that same direction. So the sweater was knit top down, but the ribbing was picked up later and worked. And, and you can see how I picked up the stitches at the base of this cable here so that it, it's not really at the continuity of the V of one stitch just going over into the ribbing like you'd normally do. In this case, if, the, if everything was worked in that direction, in this case, I picked up uh, this, these two stitches of ribbing through the centers of these stitches so that they're, they're, the bases of those stitches are meeting exactly and going in the opposite direction because I wanted the edges to line up here and I wasn't concerned so much with the exact stitch flowing from one space into the other. If I'd matched the stitches up, I would have had this stitch lined up perfectly with this stitch and then this one would have had a half a stitch and then another half a stitch would have been, would, there would have been a jog in the pattern. It would have been more disruptive than to have this transition right here. So this is a lace sweater. And so lace can be tricky because of the yarn overs and multiple stitches coming out of a yarn over and multiple stitches are decreasing. But we can, we can start with the same fundamentals, which is to look for Vs. So let's look in the body of this sweater to see to see if we can find the V's. So one of the things that we can do is we can look at the, the shape. We can see that the yarn overs are forming sort of a boundary around this little shape right here. And then we have another little diamond shape here. So we this might be hard to, to distinguish the stitches from each other, but look at this. This is a single stitch connecting this diamond to that diamond. And you can see the V, the single V traveling up. And then the other thing that we can look at are the decreases. And we can see that on the edge of this diamond, we've got decreases going in that direction and in this direction right here. So we can see that we have full stitch right here on the edge. What's tricky though about this particular sweater is that all of the pieces were not knit from the bottom up. The body was knit from the bottom up, but the sleeves, we can, if we look at those, we can tell that they were not knit from the bottom up. We use the same clues for looking at those outlines and we look close up here to see are the decreases at this edge here or are there decreases at the top edge here. So here is a, a completely stockinette sweater with stripes on it and this can be really hard to determine the directionality of the knitting. We can look for clues at the ribbing at the bottom to see which direction the ribbing was knit. Um, and we can try to see places where stitches might have been picked up. We can see do we have a full stitch at the edge and which direction does that full stitch uh, sh go. What I have here is I have uh, an edge that was done in knit one purl one ribbing with a tubular either cast on or bind off. They look very much the same. And the way you tell them apart is by looking at the stitches themselves. Now this is a tonal yarn, so it's a little trickier to see, but um, the V's of these stitches are upside down. 
So when you're looking at something with a tubular cast on, you, you're looking at the ribbing itself rather than the cast on edge to determine which direction that that ribbing was worked in. Now, sometimes though, you've got something that has a border going all the way around and you, and it looks pretty much the same. What, the, what we've got here are columns of garter stitch, um, but they're offset from each other, which means that one is that Every other column was worked in knit garter, so those stitches were knit every row, and the other columns, they were purled every row, and then you get that kind of offset, the same kind of offset you get if you were working garter stitch in the round, and you got to the end of the round, and you had that, that a one row offset. That's that same offset that you're getting here. So how would you determine something like this, which direction it was knit? So this is garter stitch, and so garter stitch is essentially a row of knits, and then there's a row of pearls on top of it and then a row of knits. Now, when you're knitting flat, you're knitting every row in regular garter stitch, but with respect to one face of the fabric, you've got knits and pearls. And so you can see that these are offset. We've got three heads of stitches here and three here, and we can look for the Vs of stitches below. So right here, I can see three full Vs, and then there's this transition to this set of three stitches and I can see three heads of stitches here. But what does it look like if I turn the fabric upside down? So when we look when we look on the fabric at this side, we don't see three full Vs. We see two Vs in the knit stitches and we see a half a V here and a half a V here. And then these upper bumps, similarly, we've got two full upper bumps and then a half bump and a half bump. So that tells us that the direction of knitting was not in that direction, but instead was in this direction. And so we can rotate this around and know that we were looking at something that was knit in this direction. Now, sometimes things aren't just knit in, what, in this direction or that direction. Sometimes they're knit in a modular fashion. And that's what this was. But again, we can look, we can look and we can see these three distinct triangles here. The triangles are all the same, but they're in, in they, they appear to be knit in different directions and they were. So let's look at all the clues that we have to figure out which direction they were knit. The first thing that we can look at is this cable. So we can see the V's of the stitches. We've got four complete V's and we've got complete V's that are right next to the transition of the pearl columns. And again, we can see there's columns of V's coming right up to the pearl columns. Now you may not be able to tell this completely by looking at it, but the way this sweater was started was with this triangle. And then stitches were picked up along this edge here, and then stitches were cast on to create the edges of those triangles. And then each of the tri these three triangles were worked at one time in rows toward the center. And so decreases were worked at these transitions from one triangle to another. And then to, to complete the other half of the peplum, stitches were picked up along. I think for this one, stitches were cast on here and then they were picked up along here. And then again, they were knit back and forth in rows um, with each of the triangles getting smaller and smaller and the stitches were reduced by decreasing along these transition points. So when, once we've recognized that each of those triangles was worked toward the narrow top, and then we can look at what's going on on this transition line here, and we can look for the decreases that were being used, and we can see that, that right here we have a decrease that points to the left, and over here we have a decrease that points to the right. And that, so that tells us what kind of decrease was being used. So oftentimes someone will post a photo of a knitted item on Ravelry, and then they'll ask, how was this knit? What is the stitch pattern? How was this constructed? And often the photo they post shows the knitted item upside down. So it's a pretty important step to first figure out the direction of knitting and then you can move on to figuring out how was this actually constructed? Where are the decreases? Where are the increases? Because if you're looking at something sideways or upside down, it's going to be really, really impossible to figure that out. Late Sunday evening, I posted part one of the August sock knit along. So the, 
The knit along actually begins, casting on begins on August 1st, but we have some work to do ahead of time in terms of taking measurements, doing gauge swatches, and then calculating our own personal pattern for our socks. So I've had a few questions about, am I providing a pattern for the knit along? And the, the point of the knit along is for you to create a pattern for your feet. So socks are typically knit or designed by formula, and that formula is based on a single measurement, and that measurement is a circumference. So the, the entire sock is designed with the assumption that that particular circumference is going to be meaningful for the entire circumference of the leg and the foot, and it's also used to determine length of things. So, so these formulas are based on standard proportions. And even if we are think of ourselves as sort of basically medium or basically large and, and pretty much conform to that particular size, that doesn't mean that everything about us is, is medium or is large or is small. For example, I am slightly taller than average for a woman. I'm five foot six. My legs are exactly average length. My hands and my feet are really medium length. My torso, though, is a little bit long. And what I've learned when I've since I've been knitting socks is that I have kind of a skinny ankle, particularly for a woman of my height, my size. You'd expect that I'd have an ankle that would be a little bit bigger than that. And so I have a skinny ankle but I have a very tall heel. And because I have that skinny ankle, the formulas for socks are going to expect that I also have a short heel. And that's where fit issues come in, is this expectation that because something is this big around, that means something else is going to be this long. So that's the point of the knit along, is to show you what the, how the formula works and then how to compare that to what your body measurements actually are. One of the tasks that I assigned in part one was for you to take measurements of your feet and your, and your legs and, and trace your foot. And this is something that I've been doing with my friends and family for more than 10 years. When I get together with long distance family, or if I was in a large gathering of my friends that were close friends, but maybe I don't live close to them and so I only see them periodically, I would take paper and pen with me and a measuring tape and I would measure <laughs> different parts of them. They would know that at some day I was going to knit something for them, but they wouldn't know what it was. And so for my friends and family, I tend to take their measurements of their hands and their feet. And then also I do some head measurements. But the feet I keep on these little pieces of paper. And then I, I've handwritten all of the, the relevant measurements. But what's really interesting to me as I look through all of these feet is that most of my women friends wear a size eight and a half shoe. And yet there is quite a variance in foot length. There's a big variance in ankle measurement. There is a, a variance in ball of foot measurement, not just compared to each other, but compared to themselves. There's this expectation in sock design that the ankle measurement and the ball of foot measurement are going to be very close. And that is what the sock is designed around. The leg and the foot circumference are both the same. And I have knit for very few people in which I didn't have to make some kind of adjustment either in the leg or the foot in order to accommodate a difference in circumference. Sometimes the, the, the difference is maybe half an inch, but often it's a full inch and in some cases it's two inches. When you start getting a difference in measurements that are that far from the, the norm, then you really get run into fit issues. So that's what the purpose of this knit along is, is, is to understand the formula and then understand how your measurements are going to uh, impact the fit if you use that formula and then make modifications accordingly. Some of you are going to have fit issues that are very simple to accommodate and others are going to be a little trickier. And so I'll be sharing with you some of the fit challenges that I have uh, faced with some people that I've knit with. So no, I'm not providing you with a pattern. I'm providing you with the tools for you 
to create a pattern for yourself, but you'll be guided through it, through the entire process. And then not only will you be able to knit something that fits you, you will have the information and the reference materials so that when you want to knit a sock for somebody else who may have the same fit issues or who may have very different fit issues, you will have the tools to be able to knit socks that fit them as well. So I thought I'd let you know we've got people, including the United States, there are people from 12 different countries who are going to be participating in the knit along, at least so far. I'm sure that more will be added as we go. Um, so we have the Netherlands, France, Italy, South Africa, Great Britain, Japan, Canada, Germany, Norway, Belgium, and Israel. So that's really exciting that we've got people from all over the place. I'm really excited. So as I've been uh, working on the materials and knitting swatches for the knit along reference materials, I've been thinking about what socks I want to knit for myself during this knit along. And I would like to try some new, some things that I haven't done, some combinations of things that I haven't tried before for my own socks. And one of the things that I'm going to do is use a yarn that I've never used before. I bought this at a shop that's now out of business. It's called West Yorkshire Spinners Signature Yarn. So it's a 35% blue face Lester, which is, is interesting to me. I don't think I've ever knit a pair of socks that contain blue face Lester. And I bought three skeins of the yarn at that time. So I bought these two self-striping colors and I bought this solid color. So I thought that this could work with either one of these if I wanted to do contrast toes, heels, um, ribbing at the top, any of those. And so I've been thinking about, well, which combination? I think this is a little bit too samey samey for me. And so I'm going to go with these two. And I haven't yet decided how much contrast and where I'm going to use it. If it's gonna be ribbing, heel, and toes, or just one of those, or two of those, or all three of them, I really don't know yet. I don't tend to worry about running out of sock yarn when I'm knitting for myself. I usually only use about 75 grams of a 100 gram ball for myself. I sometimes worry about it when I'm knitting for a man. And in that case, I will often choose a heel that can be done at the end, like a peasant heel, um, so that if I need to introduce a contrast yarn, I can. But if it looks like I'm going to have enough yarn to knit the entire pair with the ball of yarn, then I will do that. So sometimes I plan ahead. Yes, definitely I will be using a contrast yarn. And sometimes uh, I make that decision as I'm finishing the socks, either think either by deciding that I will use a contrast for the toes or the heels or both. So what I'll be doing this weekend is doing my gauge swatch for this yarn since it's not one I've used before. Uh, I'm going to see if I can get my standard nine stitches per inch on the needles that I usually use. But it's possible that I'll get a different gauge. I just don't know when it's a yarn I haven't used before. In light of the fact that part one was about selecting yarn and doing gauge swatches, I thought I'd do some overhead about uh, yarn and gauge and also about reinforcing yarn in case that's something that you are wondering about. These are just a few of the sock yarns I have in my personal stash. And so I want to talk a little bit about how these are similar and how these are different and how I would handle swatching for these. When you look at these yarns, if you, if you were to just look at the thread side by side, they would all seem to be very, very close in, in weight and handle in very similar ways. So a couple of these yarns have about 400 meters, which is about 437 yards. Um, the West Yorkshire Spinners yarn is that way. So again, 400 meters, seven stitches per inch. This yarn, which isn't in a ball band, is um, Opal, which is a yarn that also recommends on its label seven stitches per inch. But this one has 400 and about 65 yards, it's, it's uh, 425 meters, about 465 yards. So this has quite a bit more yardage than the West Yorkshire spinner yarn. And yet both of these say to work them at seven stitches per inch, or 28 stitches over four inches or 10 centimeters. 
Now, this is a Regia yarn. This is Lang Javel. And this is Online Super Sock. And these three, this one has 420 meters. This has 420 meters. And this one has 420 meters. So these are all 420 meters. They're in between those other two yarns in terms of yardage. And these, all three of them, say 30 stitches over four inches or 10 centimeters. So that's seven and a half stitches per inch. So these are in between those two yarns that both say seven stitches per inch. This one, this Barocco Socks is 440 yards, which is about 406 meters, very, very close to the West Yorkshire Spinners. And this one says 30 stitches over four inches or 10 centimeters, just like those mid, those middle yarns that I was showing earlier. This is Madeline Tosh Twist Light. This one has 384 meters, which is 420 yards. So this has the least amount of yarn of all of these, but this also says to work it at 26 to 30 stitches over four inches. So I'm very familiar with uh, Regia and I know that I'm going to use a two millimeter needle and I'm going to get nine stitches per inch. I'm going to assume that I'm going to, I'm going to check it as I'm knitting my sock. But if I'm using Regia, I don't do a gauge swatch. I've used it enough times. I know what needle I need. I know what stitch count I need. So I wouldn't do a, a gauge swatch for this one. But the West York's Yorkshire Signature Yarn is new to me and it has enough of a difference in its yardage that I really do want to check my gauge with this and see how it turns out. So often when I swatch, even if I'm going to be knitting in the round, I will just swatch flat because I know that my gauge when I knit flat is pretty much the same as when it uh, when I'm knitting in the round. I, I don't have a difference in my purl gauge, which is the problem that some knitters have. If I'm really not sure or if it's really important for me to measure my in the round gauge, and it would be really important if my flat gauge and in the round gauge were different, then I do a fake in the round swatch. And um, I've done a video on this in the past, but this is the one I've done for this yarn. So I'm swatching a yarn that has a ball band recommendation of seven stitches per inch. So I'm trying to aim for eight stitches per inch. So I use a US one, a 2.25 millimeter needle to do that. Now I normally knit my actual socks on a smaller needle, but I just wanted to, to do this to see how close I would get to eight stitches an inch. So I've only knit about an inch's worth. You could knit more, especially if you're not confident. Um, but what I wanted to show you is how I actually go about measuring the gauge for this when it's all curled up. Well, first of all, when you do this fake in the round swatch, you don't want to measure all the way from edge to edge. You wanna exclude the actual edge stitches. So I'm going to pin this down and I'm going to put the pin in uh, two stitches in from the edge. I'm just going to stick the pin there and I'm not stretching this at all. I want it to be as relaxed as possible. And again, two stitches from the edge and I'm going to pin that down. Now, again, I want to make care be careful that I'm not stretching this out while I'm pinning this down. I'm just trying to keep the edges from rolling. And again, I want to exclude those two stitches. So the pin is helping me define where the boundaries that I am going to be uh, measuring. Let's do one more. So I did a little garter stitch edge because that gives my fingernail something to kind of hold on to right there when I'm holding it down. So what I want to measure, I have 32 stitches here, and so I don't want to measure the two edge stitches at each end. Um, so I'm only going to be measuring 28 stitches. So then I have a, this is flexible, but it's flat. Uh, I prefer an actual ruler over a measuring tape because the measuring tapes kind of are floppy. So I, I feel like I get a better result with an actual flat ruler. So I'm, I'm following that ditch between the stitches 
where that need where that pin is and I'm lining up the zero and I'm coming over to the right where the pin on the right is and I can see that in those 28 stitches uh, measure three and a half inches so what would happen if I was actually um, over a little bit more maybe the three and a half was right in the middle of a stitch how would I measure 28 stitches well I probably wouldn't what I would do is look for an easy thing to measure which would be three and a half inches and then I would just if it was a fraction of a stitch I would count it as a fraction of a stitch so if that three and a half lined up in the middle of stitch 28 I would say that I had 27 and a half stitches over three and a half inches so but I, I really have all 28 in the three and a half right there so then I can calculate my gauge you don't have to have full inches you don't have to have full stitches but one or the other should be something that's easy to make to make the division work so what if you feel like you're not sure what if you feel well is it 27 and a half stitches and three and a half inches or is it 28 stitches well we're working with a lot of stitches per inch here and we're working them over a small circumference of maybe eight inches give or take an inch that tiny fraction of a stitch over the course of those eight inches is not going to amount to much so that isn't something to, to be too anxious about the yarns I've been showing you all have uh, some nylon content in them I think they're all super washable as well so they're all machine washable and they all have nylon sometimes you'll get a yarn that isn't machine washable but does have nylon and sometimes you'll get a yarn that doesn't have nylon at all whether it's super wash or not so if you have a yarn without nylon you might want some reinforcing yarn and it comes in different forms these yarns right here that are on these little cards these are 75% wool 25% nylon and so you might use these while you're working the heel or the ball of the foot you might carry this yarn with your uh, sock yarn in order to help reinforce it or you can do the reinforcing after the fact another option is this particular yarn comes with a spool of reinforcing yarn inside the yarn itself is already has nylon in it but they come with this and it's always color coordinated with the colorway that it's in so there there's uh, about 10 grams of reinforcing yarn that you could use um, while you're knitting knitting the socks and I I've never had to use these because like I said this yarn has nylon um, but it looks to me like you'd match up where you were in the color sequence and then you could knit this along and it wouldn't interrupt your color sequence these kinds of yarns you try to match as close as you can and it's going to affect um, the color a little bit another option is to use this it's called woolly nylon is one brand this is the brand by Guterman and so it's for overlock machines or serger machines that are used in order to machine uh, so knit fabrics you can get them in a ton of colors schoolhouse press sells the actual brand that's called woolly nylon and the colors that they carry tend to be very sock like colors like blues and greens and browns and creams and things like that if you are interested in following along with the august sock knit along even if you don't aren't participating yourself but you want to see what other people are doing there is a project tag for the knit along um, which I'll put on the screen here and if you go on Ravelry and you do a pattern search you can then select projects and in there you, you can write out the name of the tag and you can see all of the Ravelry projects that have been created using that tag so you're not going to see everybody who has purchased uh, the the knit along documentation um, you're not going to see everyone who's created Ravelry projects necessarily you're only going to see the people who have created that tag in there some people are going to never create a Ravelry project and some people are never going to tag their projects so but it will give you an idea of some of what's going on along you'll be able to see people's project photos and um, and you can also follow along in my Ravelry group 
rocks rocks and there are threads for the August sock knit along if you're interested in reading those. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.